In January 1999, Prince Edward announced his engagement to Sophie Rhys-Jones. She will be the last royal bride of the century and the millennium. She's often compared to Diana, Princess of Wales, who was 19 at her engagement in 1981. A shy kindergarten assistant, Diana had little experience of publicity or of the family she would enter. For 34-year-old Sophie, things are different. She has served a five-year apprenticeship with the family firm. Diana's marriage seemed a glittering fairy tale, but it ended in divorce and tragedy. Sophie will avoid Diana's mistakes. The best thing Sophie can do for herself is to establish her own identity and step out of Diana's shadow. Sophie has already taken the initiative in dealing with speculation about her personal life. Contrary to popular opinion, we've never lived together and I've never issued any ultimatums. Edward's delay in making Sophie his bride had caused rumours of a split. He had uh, Charles and Diana's divorce, he had uh, Fergie and Andrew's divorce, and he had the sad death of Diana. Uh, if he'd got uh, married to Sophie at any time in the past few years, it would have be been as the good news the royal family desperately needed. He didn't want that, it was too much pressure. In the, in the right. Edward wanted Sophie to have a slower and smoother passage into royal life than Diana or Fergie, the Duchess of York. At first, he was concerned that the media would spoil his relationship with this very special girlfriend. To protect Sophie from press intrusion, he took the unusual step of making a direct appeal to newspaper editors. The press were hounding her, certainly were hounding her, and uh, Edward put out a fax from Buckingham Palace asking them to lay off. I don't think he was scared of, uh, of losing her, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't happen. I think he's just, he is genuinely concerned about that sort of behaviour, and he didn't see, he didn't think it was fair, especially as, the, as, though they, as they weren't even engaged. And social activities are established. Edward's romance was revealed in December 1993 after Diana temporarily withdrew from public life. Learning how to cope with brain injury. In this speech, she blamed the media for her problems. Have changed. When I started my public life 12 years ago, I understood the media might be interested in what I did. I realized then their attention would inevitably focus on both our private and public lives. But I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become. As the separated wife of the Prince of Wales, Diana's role with the media, as with the royal family, was uncertain. But with the public, she was still the greatest star in the theatre of royalty. At first, Sophie unwisely chose styles reminiscent of Diana's, but she never achieved the same charismatic effect. In 1994, Sophie joined Edward and his family for the wedding of Princess Margaret's daughter, Sarah Armstrong Jones. Waiting for Sarah, the royal family drew the crowd's cheers, but they knew that Diana's presence would upstage the bride. I think it was a very difficult time for the Princess of Wales. She knew that people were looking at her for the right reasons and for the wrong reasons. And in a sense, at weddings particularly, anything she did could be interpreted however you'd like to look at it. If she came in late, people would say, oh, she wants to steal the bride's thunder. If she came in early, people would say, well, she wants to steal the bride's thunder. I think she was in an almost untenable position because it is true that wherever she went and however she went, the camera, the people, they couldn't take their eyes off for her. Diana wanted attention to focus on the bride and her attendants, including Princess Anne's daughter, Zara. Sarah, the Queen's only niece, had been one of Diana's friends in the royal family, and she had no wish to ruin her big day. But Diana and her look-alike, Sophie, were bound to attract comment. If Sophie's smart, she will absorb what happened to Diana and work out her own look. 
Diana decided towards the end that the clean, pared down, very simple, chic line was best for her. It certainly photographed very well. Um, but, you know, she mustn't be seen to be copying Diana, too, because that would be disastrous. Sarah's wedding was Sophie's first royal event, although she had often joined Edward's family at church, a privilege not accorded her predecessors. Diana took a close interest in Sophie's royal progress. Her self-sufficiency enabled her to cope under pressure. A public relations executive, she could deal easily with questions. Any comments about the stories in the papers this morning, Sophie? I think you're all getting a little too excited. Please. Sophie's work, especially for a London radio station, had meant frequent contact with the media. Somehow she balanced the dual role. Why are you leaving your job here? I think Sophie Rees Jones is coping brilliantly with all the intention. I mean, she is a PR woman herself, so she knows exactly, I think, the right distance to keep from people, which is important. She has shown immense professional dignity, uh, immense professional determination, and I think a rather engaging, quiet charm that is now her own. I mean, she seems to have found herself and found her confidence and, and seems comfortable with it all. She knows her place now, it's, it's there and she's, she's, she's happy about that. Sophie grew up in Brenchley, a quiet village in rural Kent, and seemed set for a typical middle-class life. She and her brother David lived in a comfortable, rather than ostentatious, home. Security and stability were key values to their parents, Christopher and Mary Rees Jones. Well, I would call her country middle-class. Uh, her parents are not rich, but uh, they believe that education is a better indicator of class than money. So uh, they were prepared to spend the money they, do, they did have and do have on a good education for Sophie. She went to a private school in Kent. She very much had a village, middle-class upbringing. She gained eight O-levels at school, but Sophie was an unexceptional pupil in a class that included a future Olympic swimmer. Sophie was a good mixer. She liked the theatre and sport, a foretaste of the interest she would share with her prince. In 1977, the Queen's Silver Jubilee year, Sophie played netball for her school. She grew up into an attractive young woman with no shortage of male admirers. She is an extremely popular girl. She's uh, a sport, she's a great sport. She'll take part in any sort of game, uh, a really fun-loving out, outdoor girl. Once uh, on a capital radio trip, a chap called Marino Franchi, who was nobody at that time, broke into her bedroom, well, into the room she was sharing with another girl, and necked a pair of her neckers. And that night at a, a, con at a concert, uh, they appeared on stage, dressed, and they stripped down until uh, Sophie realised they were wearing her knickers and started screaming, you dirty blah, 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 and running all the way back to the hotel, but she found it very amusing. Compared with Fergie's excesses, stories like this seem tame. Sophie avoided real scandals. After A-level, she worked in London, then in Switzerland as a ski rep. She later accompanied a boyfriend to his native Australia. When they broke up, she dated Australian Eon Balmain for several months. She's 34, she's been around the block, she's had a couple of flings, uh, only a couple of serious love affairs. The Australian ski instructor uh, was the most serious, I think. She followed him back to Aussie, but then it cooled down. Often when you fall in love in the snow slopes, it turns out you know, a bit of a damp squid when you get home. And she was befriended by a guy called Ian Balmain, another Australian. He'd sort of took on yachting trips. I don't know how close that relationship was, but he did come to England with her and offered to sell the story to uh, one of the Sundays, probably the News of the World, but something made him change his mind. I'm not quite sure what, and he's never spoken a bad word about her. After working briefly in Australia, Sophie travelled with Eon and their friends, visiting tourist areas like the Blue Mountain and the Great Barrier Reef. She loved deep sea diving and sailing. However, in 1991, this idyllic life came to an end. 
think she was hoping to get married and set, settle down in Aussie. And when everything went slightly wrong, she started getting homesick. The English girls want to come back to some more sophisticated people, if I could put it that way. And uh, she did immediately. And she w went to work for uh, Brian McLaurin, where she really honed up on her skills. And her popularity was fantastic. She's pop very popular with all the clients. Just over to your right, if you could. To me. Public relations brought her into contact with the hard side of the media. She learned to please the cameras as well as the clients. Sophie was skilled at organizing people and events. In 1993, her boss, Brian McLaurin, asked her to promote Prince Edward's Summer Challenge, held for the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme. It was a complete accident. Every girl's dream, uh, how to meet a prince, uh, completely by fluke. Uh, Sophie stood in for a celebrity who had had to back out of a photo uh, shoot with Edward at the last minute. She went along, uh, Edward liked what he saw and posed happily for pictures with Sophie. <laughs> Later, she started her own public relations company in London's Mayfair. She is an independent, accomplished young woman. But it was her connection with Edward that made her famous. Hello magazine certainly wouldn't have run her story on Sophie if she hadn't been involved with Prince Edward. It just so happened that um, there was a gap in the royal ranks for a, a young, attractive woman, and Sophie's filled it. You know, Diana has disappeared now. Increasingly a solo royal, Diana grew into a global icon. She became an international celebrity, fated around the world, as here in Washington in 1990. As Diana's royal role was changing, she found a new rival, one who could look uncannily like her. Sophie's dress by Thomas Starshevsky bore a certain resemblance to Diana's red gown by Victor Edelstein. Sophie's necklines and hairstyles were noted. She was nicknamed the New Diana. There's absolutely no danger whatsoever that Sophie's a new Diana. A lot of people in Australia and America seem to think she is because she's filled the gap that's left by Diana. But she, there's just no comparison between the two. Sophie's shorter. She's, um, she hasn't got the wonderful peachy complexion that Diana had. She's got quite a lot of freckles. She's much more of a simple, natural outdoor girl. Um, doesn't wear much makeup surprisingly, for someone in her position. And uh, she's got quite a, a short torso, so she doesn't show off clothes as well as Diana did. She needs to dress more carefully. Diana was arguably at her most glamorous in her last years, as here in Argentina in 1995. She was ambivalent towards her style rival, Sophie, sometimes worrying about her prospects in the royal family, but mostly deriding her imitation. She's done too many things that I know used to irritate Diana. She cut her hair like Diana's. She even went to lose weight and keep fit at the Chelsea Harbour Club, which was Diana's, you know, famous fitness centre. She's done, you know, chosen dresses, red dresses that were almost identical to things that Diana wore, the blazer and the... And the trousers that Diana wore. She just seemed to be aping Diana, and Diana was sort of partly amused and partly irritated by it. She used to say, oh, look, here comes my double. I mean, even the designer she likes, Thomas Starzewski, used to design for Diana. She really ought to get her own look, and there are plenty of things she could do. She could dress in softer, less tailored clothes, just to find her own look. And um, I think she even thinks that she can outsmart the media the way Diana tried to do. Well, believe me, you can't. Diana was never reviled like Fergie over her occasional fashion lapses. She is remembered for her unique allure and her incomparable magnetism. Well Sophie may never be described like Fergie as a style-free zone, but not everyone approved of her engagement suit. The engagement outfit she wore looked to me like something you wear at 6 o'clock in the evening, not 11 o'clock in the morning, partly because it had glittery beads all over it. 
And that smacks of a cocktail hour, not, you know, a morning engagement. The other problem with that outfit was that it was grey and standing next to a prince in a dark suit didn't exactly make them look a colourful pair. If she'd been as clever as I think she is, she would have worn something that was more colourful, a pastel, you know, this spring we're told that lilac and blue and, and pink are the big colours for spring. She seemed to ignore all that and she wore grey, which is a colour which was in two years ago. So, you know, I think Sophie has to um, study the fashion pages and the glosses a bit more carefully. Sophie may take on royal appointments. She already has experience through her promotional work with the Cancer Macmillan Relief Fund and other charities. Behind the scenes, grooming has ensured that she already looks and speaks like a born royal. Children were wonderful. Not one of them cried, not one of them refused to go on. And, um, I think they made it a lot of fun for everybody. They're, they're brilliant. Ex-Rolling Stone Bill Wyman and his family helped Sophie promote a children's fashion parade for the charity Baby Lifeline. Any smart royal who gets involved with a baby charity is doing themselves a power of good because it's much more difficult to get, you know, handicapped people, mentally disabled people in, in a, a newspaper or on television. It's just a fact of life. It's, it's not politically correct, but it happens to be a fact. So, you know, you notice that Diana really became world famous for cuddling, appealing little children. So I think, you know, Sophie um, was, was, you know, she's a PR girl. She knows how the world works. And I'm not saying that her motives were purely sort of uh, to exploit that side of the, of the um, baby charity, but uh, it certainly has not done her any harm. Mixing with celebrities was part of Sophie's work. She has many showbiz friends, just as Diana did. But Sophie's predecessor had qualities that were so unique they can never be copied. The handicapped or disadvantaged found a remarkable empathy in Diana, and ordinary children everywhere were drawn in by her boundless affection. But such charisma had its downside. Diana could hardly go anywhere without a throng of cameramen recording her every movement. Tragically, this media obsession contributed to her death. Now Sophie must find a way to cope with her own celebrity status. Scenes like these will be frequently repeated now that she is the new royal star. Sophie will look to Prince Edward for guidance and support in the early and testing years ahead. Sophie is no stranger to palaces. She is a regular guest at Windsor Castle and at all the other royal residences. The Queen riding at Windsor with Sophie took an instant liking to this uncomplicated friendly girl and gave her unprecedented access to the royal homes. She stayed many, many times at Buckingham Palace. She has her room in Edward's apartment. He has his room. Uh, exactly where they uh, sleep is, is uh, something I don't really know. It would be a shame after being together for five years if they'd never done the deed. To the royals, Sophie is Diana without the dramas and Fergie without the frivolities. But what does she think of her future in-laws? I think Sophie's had plenty of time to decide what she does and doesn't like about the royal family. We're talking about uh, you know, five, six years of living that life. Um, uh, Diana had a much uh, quicker introduction into the royal family. 
the, the engagement and marriage uh, was done and dusted within a relatively short time. So she learned about the life uh, as she grew into it. And she was also, of course, much younger than Sophie when she married. Diana was 18 or 19, not a particularly formed personality at that time. Sophie's uh, into her 30s, and if she doesn't know what she does and doesn't like about the royal family now, then she's never going to know. As Sophie's future mother-in-law, the Queen has effortlessly formed a close friendship with her son's wife-to-be. She's told friends, Sophie has made me smile again. The royal family's problems have undoubtedly bonded Edward and Sophie together. They've spent several years, after all, under the same roof. They've experienced the, the strains and the, and, the, and the enormous emotional turmoil of the royal family at a hideous time in the last ten years for them. They've seen the damage, they've watched the hurt, they've seen the, the, the sort of disadvantages of being royal, which, which are legion, I would have thought. And I think that both of them have found something in each other, at least I hope they have, I'm sure they have, that will sustain them as a couple in the future. Elizabeth had been queen for 12 years by the time Edward was born in 1964. Now there was a mix of teenagers and toddlers at the palace. Charles was 15 and 13. Their brother Andrew was four. This time round, the Queen made more time for her younger children. She cherished her second family and doted on her last son, whose childhood marked a period of great stability for the royal family. His grandmother seemed an eternally warm and welcoming presence in their lives. In Scotland, they broke off their journey to greet her before spending their annual summer holiday at Balmoral. On weekends away from boarding school, there were walks through the grounds of Frogmore at Windsor, one of several royal houses. Edward grew up in a highly privileged environment that inevitably separated him from the real world. You're the Queen's youngest son. So, like many youngest sons, Edward was pampered, privileged. So he was always very prone as a youngster to being rather arrogant and pompous. I don't particularly blame him for that because I think it comes with the territory. I think people tend to lose sight of that, that they judge members of the royal family by everyday life, and they don't live an everyday life. They live a life where you have a... I mean, Edward still has a, a valet who brings him a, a biscuit at half past six and a cup of tea in the morning. I mean, that's how they live. They have nannies until they're sort of 70. Uh, it's very much a, a, a world that, that we don't appreciate. Andrew and Edward, still a Gordonston schoolboy, acted as supporters when Charles married in 1981. No one could guess the turbulence that lay ahead. The royal family were unknowingly facing a private revolution. Within a few years, their world, that had seemed so secure, would fall apart with devastating consequences. In 1983, during their Commonwealth tour, Charles and Diana met Edward in New Zealand, where he spent a year teaching before going to Cambridge and the fun of student life. Hopefully this will be the first and last time that my birthday will fall on rag day. That's been a rag week. It's been very tiring. Anyway, you're in good company today. You have probably the most professional crawlers in the world standing in front of you. I've been waiting to say that all week. Tighten your nappies. Fasten your safety pins. Take a firm grip on your dummies. I will start you. Are you ready? Ready to sign by the balloons? For the greatest crawl in the world, all your marks, crawl! When Andrew married in 1986, Edward had graduated and joined the Royal Marines. Andrew's bride, Sarah Ferguson, would bring drama and farce into the Royal family and Edward would soon leave the Marines for a theatrical career. I don't think Edward ever wanted to be a Marine. Uh, traditionally, there is a, a, a tradition that uh, the princes go into the services, 
and so he had to follow his brothers by doing the same sort of thing and his father. It just is a natural thing for the royal family to do. It's just tradition. Um, I'm sure he would have been far happier becoming an actor and going to RADA. He once told a female journalist, she asked him, uh, if you'd had the chance, uh, would you become an actor? And he said, yes, I would. No, swap over. Like Charles, Edward had begun acting at school and continued as a student. The Cambridge Reviews provided the slapstick comic roles that he preferred. <laughs> The dressing up and excitement of stage production took hold. The appeal of acting, the theatre, showbiz in general, all comes from the way the royal family lived. They, they are surrounded by people who dress up in funny costumes. They like to dress up, they like to play party games where you dress up and act roles. It's one of the traditions of family holidays at Sandringham and Balmoral. The royal family, their heroes and heroines are movie people. They, you know, they, they are starstruck as anybody else. DiCaprio arrives or... Michael Caine and, you know, they, they really have them because they've got nobody else to look up to, so they, they really are. I think that's part, partly, but I think he just is arty, like some people are and some people aren't. In 1987, Andrew and Fergie took part in It's a Royal Knockout, a game show in fancy dress organised by Edward. The day that he um, was filming It's a Knockout, it was a horrible day. The weather was foul. Um, the media sat drenched in the rain all day long. So at the end of the day, when he came in for a press conference with everybody and he said, don't you think that was wonderful? They all said, well, no, not really. <laughs> we didn't very much. They'd had hardly any access. They certainly weren't allowed to get any pictures because Edward had done an exclusive deal and they're all thoroughly fed up. I only hope that you've enjoyed yourselves. Have you? Well, thanks for sounding so bloody enthusiastic. <laughs> what have you been doing in here all day? <laughs> have you been watching it? Yes. Yeah. What did you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> thanks. I thought it was great. <laughs> he took this as a terrible personal criticism, and I remember one reporter filing the story that he flounced out of the press conference like a ballerina with a ladder in her tights. And he, he was just not prepared to um, see the other side of the story. He couldn't see that this huddled mass of wet reporters and photographers were just, you know, thoroughly fed up and wanted to go home. Edward started working for the composer Andrew Lloyd Webber at a London theatre. On the first day, the press waited for Edward Windsor, as he now called himself. On cue, the prince jokingly indicated his lowly role as a production assistant by carrying tea bags. Later, Edward left the theater and formed his own television company, Ardent Productions. While he moved in theatrical circles, gossip about his private life became a source of annoyance. It all started, in fact, uh, from Edward saying, I'm not gay. And with the, that classic uh, newspaper trick, uh, the headline on the front page was, Edward says, I'm not gay. The whole world had no idea whether he was gay or not before he said that. It's, um, and since then, it's been open season on discussing his sexuality. I just think people should forget about it. He likes the company of gay people. He's possibly so uh, convinced of his own heterosexuality, it doesn't bother him. He gets on extremely well with gays. He gets on extremely well in all the theatrical set. But it really bothered uh, Sophie that he was, uh, a lot of people said he was gay. And she said to uh, a close friend, he is definitely not gay. I can guarantee that. So <laughs> take it from there. 
Edward's main sporting interest is real tennis, a cross between lawn tennis and squash, which he took up after sustaining too many injuries on the rugby field. He said, with real tennis, I could belt the ball as hard as possible and it would come back into court off the back wall, perfect for a slogger like me. Real tennis had some majestic fans, notably King Henry VIII. But what of his romantic life? Princess Martha Louise of Norway was just one of Edward's girlfriends along the way. But perhaps it was a shared love of sport that was to be the deciding factor. It was Sophie who eventually won his heart at a real tennis match. He found that her confidence and professionalism helped her cope with the publicity surrounding their romance. I think uh, when he was younger, he uh, and, and the girls involved did find the press attention particularly difficult. And this is why I think he, he and Sophie have done so well. Uh, being that little bit older and a little bit wiser, they've been able to compromise where necessary and uh, get along quite well with the public attention. They've done very well on that sphere. It's hard to say whether being a PR girl helped Sophie become a princess or not. It certainly made her fairly astute and I think that Edward appreciated that she knew the ropes. It wasn't like plucking an ordinary girl out of obscurity. Sophie already was familiar with the way the media works and she's mentioned in interviews that she knows all their tricks. So in that sense it's helped her and it's probably helped Edward. The decommissioning of the Royal Yacht Britannia in November 1997 was a nostalgic event for the Queen and the Royal Family. Sophie's presence at the emotional ceremony was another clue to her acceptance within the royal fold. She uh, makes every effort to fit in. Uh, Sophie goes out riding with the Queen, so she, she really was a pretty hopeless rider, and she's still not very good. And she says she's got an electric bottom, which means that when she gets on a horse, it takes off at a great rate of knots, which, of course, the rest of the royals think is hilarious. But Sophie tries, she doesn't mind um, making a fool of herself, getting her hair out of place, her makeup uh, askew. She's very much uh, in the tradition of what the Queen likes. The royal family disliked the way Diana always stole the show with her clothes and conduct, distracting attention at solemn events like VJ Day in 1994. I'm pretty certain that the royal family look on Sophie as a very good substitute for Diana because she's the sort of substitute that suits them. She's not as high profile as Diana, never will be. She's not as gorgeous as Diana. She's the sort of person they wish Diana had been, a girl who knows her place and doesn't try to uh, dazzle the rest of them. They'll never really have any serious problems with, with Sophie. She's in it for the long term. Royal reaction to Diana's death caused a crisis. Sophie was absent from the royal group at her funeral. She may be close to the royal family, but obviously was not considered to be part of a state event. The tragedy altered royal plans. I'm convinced that the engagement would have been announced much sooner if it hadn't been for, first of all, the divorce of Diana and Charles, and then a year later, the, the funeral of Diana. It certainly meant that um, the royal family felt it would have been distasteful to rush out happy news of an engagement. They would have felt that with all the bad publicity they'd had, the public would have been suspicious that they were trying to um, bury Diana metaphorically as well as physically and, and move on and try and say, well, it doesn't matter about her, we've got this other news to divert you now. A year after her death, a memorial service was held for Diana. There had been criticism over the royal's slow reaction to Diana's death. Now they were keen to avoid controversy. The Queen led her family, including Sophie, into Balmoral's little church where they had worshipped for many years. In December 1992, the divorced Princess Anne had married her second husband, Commander Tim Lawrence, at Crathy Church. That low-key ceremony was the last wedding of any of the Queen's children, before Edward's at Windsor this summer. The Queen is going to have, of course, an extraordinary experience at that wedding. She's going to look round her children and she's going to see 
two of them divorced, both her sons, and she's going to see her daughter divorced and remarried. And she's going to be praying, praying, please God, let it work this time. On the way to Diana's memorial service, Princess Anne, Edward and Sophie travelled with Prince William. She was now a family member in all but name. Sophie's links with various charities provided an acceptable introduction to the public life that she may be taking on as older members of the royal family retire from public life. But will Sophie's ordinary background be enough to sustain her move into regal circles? There is just one other royal wife with a middle-class background, the Danish-born Duchess of Gloucester, formerly Birgitta van Ders, a secretary. Since she married the Queen's cousin in 1972, Birgitta has blended seamlessly into her husband's family. Today, no one would suspect that she wasn't born into royal life. If Sophie's as smart as I think she is, she'll probably model herself on the Duchess of Gloucester, who doesn't give interviews, has always kept a low profile, knows her place, doesn't rock the boat, and do certainly doesn't try to um, look more glamorous or um, more appealing than the ro royal ladies who are more senior to her. I think it's very difficult to predict what Sophie, Duchess of wherever, would be like, as opposed to this nice girl from the home counties that we've got at the moment. Sometimes putting a coronet on somebody does wonders. Sometimes it's a disaster. And sometimes you hardly notice. Frankly, I think Sophie is quite likely to be the invisible duchess, with or without her coronet. In 1996, Edward took a 50-year lease on Bagshot Park in Surrey. He and Sophie will make it their country home. The mansion, set in 88 acres, will also be the base for Ardent Productions, his television company. The house was originally built for Edward's royal ancestor, the Duke of Connaught, Queen Victoria's favourite son. How different is the new owner? All the men in the royal family are quite self-centred and arrogant. They can't help it, it's the way they're brought up. I mean, if you grow up with people bowing and scraping to you and deferring to you and you have a bodyguard and you're always different from your friends at school, how can you help but be a little bit, you know, think yourself anyway, a little bit special? Because you are special, you're not ordinary, you're extraordinary. And so, the wife of a man like that, the wife of a prince, has to take that on board. And uh, there's two ways she can go. She can deflate the in inflated ego and stop a prince becoming too pompous. And if he's a sort of reasonable man, he will, won't mind too much. And the other route you can take is to be totally subservient, you know, and rather do what Camilla Parker Bowles has done with Prince Charles and be happy to be just a supporting player and prop the man up when he needs it. Um, I think with Sophie and Edward it's much more equal partnership. I think Edward defers to her a lot and relies on her a lot because she has had much more contact with the real world than he's had. He's a privileged prince. And um, I think that's the one great reason why this, this marriage will work. All the other royal marriages were a marriage of unequals. But this time I think they're much more evenly matched. Edward's wife will be the new focus of high society. I'm sure she'll enjoy uh, being uh, the Duchess. She has always had a hankering for uh, social position. Um, friends who've known her for many years have told me this. I don't mean that in a nasty way. I just think that's something she enjoys. I'm sure she'll have great fun being a society hostess down there but I think she'd go mad if she was there all the time. She's uh, worked until uh, into her mid-30s. She has a very successful career, and I'd be amazed if she wanted to give it up. This is, this is very interesting, especially the uh, question of whether, whether uh, Sophie and Edward are going to have children. I mean, her biological clock is ticking on, so they've got to get around to it fairly soon. But I've got the feeling that he wants to... Uh, 
wants her to continue with her business because at the moment it's making more than he, he is. Lady Helen Windsor was the last royal bride to marry at St George's Chapel. In July 1992, as her own marriage came under scrutiny, Diana joined the royal family in this return to an earlier tradition of private weddings. St George's Chapel, Windsor, had once been the setting for royal weddings before the more public and splendid ceremonies became national events. With the breakup of that marriage, the whole idea of the royal family as a monument of national virtue, as the Ark of the Covenant of family values, was destroyed. And I think what we're seeing, and what I hope we're seeing with the marriage of Edward and Sophie, is a retreat to something more modest, something less pretentious, something more, if it's not a paradox, a sort of private royal family, or at least one in which you don't parade family values. For her wedding to Tim Taylor, Helen, the daughter of the Duke of Kent, the Queen's cousin, chose a very formal gown. Made of heavy silk with a regal neckline, it was especially created for Helen by Catherine Walker, one of Diana's favorite designers. The next bride to walk down these steps will be Sophie. What will she be wearing? Any wedding in the royal family is a solemn occasion, joyful and solemn. Not dreary, not over formal, but it's important. It's an important dress which has to match its surroundings and match the occasion at which obviously royalty are present. Sophie will want a gown to reflect her individuality. There was speculation that Thomas Starshevsky might win the coveted commission. Thomas has spoken to a lot of other couturiers. All of them have been trying to ask each other who's doing the dress. I know he is not, and I know for a fact that a very close friend of Sophie's from her school days is actually doing the dress. Sophie is going to give her a really big boost. And I think, you know, this is great, it sort of helps everybody. I think this reflects extremely well on Sophie. She's not just going for the big names. She's going to help, help people who have helped her in the past. So. But Sophie's engagement suit was by Starshevsky, who may also make some of her formal wardrobe. Her three-stone diamond engagement ring cost about £55,000. It was bought from one of her company's clients, the royal jewellers Asprey and Garrard. I suspect that the Queen will give her something, and I suspect the Queen will give her son something to give to her as well. So I imagine she will be given certain really lovely pieces to wear on and from on her wedding day. I imagine it'll be probably a tiara, earrings, necklace, and, you know, various people may give her different things, but I'm sure that will be provided for. There will be no Diana to upstage the bride, and Sarah, Duchess of York, may not be invited. But memories will surely arise of their bright promises, which turn to ashes. Ex-Royal Y are perpetual reminders of failure. The Queen began her reign by taking a public vow on the day of her accession that she would keep the monarchy as it was in the days of her father and her grandfather. And those were, at least in public, model royal marriages. And it was a model family. And these ex-wives, these ruptured marriages, are reminders to the Queen, I think, bitterly, of her own failure. And somewhere deep inside herself, at least if she's like every mother that I've known, including my own, finally, she'll probably blame herself. Christmas 1988. The days of Diana and Fergie as royal wives of Windsor have long passed, but the traumas of those times still haunt the royal family. They know that present is rooted in the past and the future in both. On the royal stage, there is another character who may share the limelight with Sophie. Charles's longtime lover, Camilla Parker Bowles. Soon after Edward's engagement, Charles attended a party at the Ritz in London. Afterwards, they left together in a blitz of camera flashes. Charles had made Camilla his public partner. 
Camilla Parker Bowles, I think, must be both the Queen's worst nightmare as a future Princess of Wales and, of course, her best possible hope. If only Charles had got to her first, Camilla is the obvious Windsor wife. Windsor women, on the whole, are not clothes horses. They're not beautiful. They're horsey. They're into headscarves and country pursuits. They have a certain, you know, good, rough breeding about them. Camilla is the perfect Windsor wife. None of the nervousness or moodiness of Diana. But unfortunately, of course, She's second helpings, and that's the difficulty. Christmas 1998, and a less glamorous royal parade makes its way to Sandringham's church. What lessons have they learned from the past? It's very difficult to say whether the royal family have learned from their mistakes. In one sense, how could they? The problems that they've had, or the problems that the Queen's children have had, are very similar to the problems that so many other parents' children have had. This is an age of marital breakdown. The problem for the royal family is a different one. It is whether you continue in an age where it is more likely that a marriage fails than that it succeeds, whether you stake so much on the outcome of that marriage. We entered into a kind of collective daydream, collective myth, that turned finally into a collective nightmare. We've all got lessons to learn, not just the royal family. Before this skiing holiday in St Moritz, Sophie said she was fully aware of her future responsibilities and was ready for commitment to royal life. But given the high failure rate of royal marriages, does she have any doubts? Sophie's had five years to prepare for this. She knows the worst. She knows what life will be like. She knows the limitations that will be placed on her. And obviously, it's, it's a deal that she's prepared to um, sign up to. She doesn't seem to mind. I think she thinks the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. She loves Edward. And I think also she loves the life. You know, the glamour of it all. I mean, she could never have gone off to St Moritz for a luxury skiing holiday if she weren't the fiancé of Prince Edward. And that is certainly a big part of the appeal, I think. Any girl would, would be enraptured by, you know, the glittering court that surrounds a royal prince. Sophie will be the third lady in the land. The ascent of an ordinary girl into the highest ranks of the royal family is the last fairy tale of the millennium. Hopefully, this one will last. If anybody's going to get married, I hope that they think that they're going to get it right. So, and uh, as I said, I mean, it's you know the, we're the, the very best of friends, and that's essential. And it also helps that we happen to love each other as well very much. And so, you know, it's great. So, we're very happy at the moment, and long may that continue. I think getting married is a very personal thing. I mean, na naturally, there's going to be more interest um, in us than there would be in other people, but um, it is a personal matter and it's a family occasion. Mm -hmm.